Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to our monthly webinar series. Today's topic is Power Quality, a Detailed Understanding of Harmonics. My name is Sarah Bauman, and I'm the Marketing Program, <clears throat> excuse me, Programs Manager for Mega NAFTA. And I'm stepping in for Jamie Smith, our Digital Marketing Specialist, as he's on his way home from the IEEE T&D Conference in Denver. I'll be acting as your moderator for today's presentation, and I'll support you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you'll see a panel that looks similar to this one. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can submit questions to me at any time throughout the presentation, not just now, but in the middle, at the end, whatever the case may be. And by typing in the, the box highlighted in red, and I'll read their questions at the end if time permits. We Unfortunately, we do get a lot of questions, so we'll try to get to them as, as time permits. Um, you are eligible to receive one NIDA CPD and one PDH or 0.1 CEU for attending. <clears throat> Excuse me. You'll receive this in an email within two business days after the webinar. The email will also include a copy of this presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. And a, a link to the video recording of the webinar. And we will have that on our website as well. So you can share that with your colleagues if you wanted to. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember, you can ask questions at any time. And we will go over them at the end of the Q at the end of the webinar in the Q and A session. Our presenter today is Sanket Bolar. He's our applications engineer in the substation area, <clears throat> and also to assist with the Q and A session, we've got a panelist, Mr. Andy Sagel. He's a product manager with Megger. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today, Sanket. Thank you, Sarah. All right, guys, so uh, let's begin with the presentation. So uh, today's agenda, the, the points that we are going to cover during today's presentation is uh, we are going to start off with the theory. So we're going to do a little bit of theory on harmonics, then we're going to move into uh, the sources of harmonics, uh, how are harmonics generated. We're going to look at some of the sources. Uh, then we're going to get into the third section, which is current and voltage, uh, what's, what's current harmonics and what's voltage harmonics. Uh, we're going to look at how harmonics are measured. Uh, we're going to see uh, what, what are harmonic indices, uh, THD, TDD, what does that mean? Uh, harmonic power, we're going to look at harmonic power flows. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about power factor. Then uh, we're going to look at uh, what effects do harmonics have? Why are harmonics so important uh, for us? Uh, harmonic evaluation procedure, uh, harmonic mitigation techniques, so how to control harmonics. So these are the points that we'll be covering during uh, the presentation. And let, let's start off with the first section. So theory, what are harmonics? So if you, if you see a clean waveform, a pure sinusoidal wave, uh, that waveform will consist only of the fundamental frequency component. What do you mean by fundamental frequency? Fundamental frequency is the is the system frequency. So in a 60 hertz system, frequency, the fundamental frequency is 60 hertz. In a 50 hertz system, it's 50 hertz. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, if you take a wave uh, and uh, that that's a complete cycle, if you say it's a 60 hertz wave, it means that it completes that uh, 60 cycles like those in one second. So that that's what you mean by frequency. So if you take a clean waveform, it, it will only have the fundamental frequency component. But, but in real life, uh, there is always some amount of distortion present in the waveform, voltage or current. And that's because there are other frequency components present in the waveform apart from the fundamental frequency component. Now those frequency components uh, produce distortion. And the frequency components which, which have frequencies which are integer multiples of the fundamental frequency are called harmonics. So let's take a simple example to, uh, to, to see what distortion looks like. Here we have a clean waveform uh, which just has the fundamental frequency component. So you can see that it's a clean sinusoid. If you look at the y-axis, you can see that the peak of the wave corresponds to a magnitude of one. 
and the on the time the time is in milliseconds uh, one this is one cycle of the waveform and it takes 16.66 milliseconds uh, to complete the cycle so uh, by looking at the time i can tell that it's it's a 60 hertz wave now let's take another wave uh, this you can uh, if you look at the x axis is the same it's 16.66 milliseconds but you see that there are three cycles in the waveform so three cycles in the same amount of time and the magnitude if you look at the y axis you will see that the peak corresponds to a value of 0.2 so the magnitude is 20% of of the fundamental wave now let's take a third waveform uh, again the time is the same but this time we have five cycles on the screen and the magnitude is again 0.2 so it's 20% of the fundamental now if you take these three waveforms with different frequencies and you mix them up together what you get is this so this is a very simple uh, representation of how uh, how the waveform gets distorted because of the presence of different frequency components okay so in the previous slide you saw that um, on the screen it said 20% third harmonic 20% fifth harmonic what what did we mean by that third fifth these numbers are called the harmonic orders and harmonic order is the ratio of the the frequency of the harmonic to the fundamental frequency so a third harmonic means that the frequency of the harmonic is uh, three times the fundamental frequency so the frequency of the wave would be 180 hertz for a fifth harmonic it would be five times the fundamental frequency so the frequency of the wave would be Five times sixty, which is three hundred hertz. Frequencies, uh, the harmonics with odd orders are called odd harmonics, and harmonics with even orders are called even harmonics. So third, fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh, those are odd harmonics. Second, fourth, sixth, eighth, and so on and so forth are the even harmonics. Harmonics can also be classified in terms of their phase sequence. So what's phase sequence? Phase sequence refers to the phase relationship between the three phases in a three-phase system. So if you look at the vector diagrams there, you'll see that the first one uh, is, is for a positive sequence system. In a positive sequence system, uh, B lags behind A by 120 degrees, C lags behind B by 120 degrees. So if you go from A to B to C, you move in a clockwise direction on the vector diagram. Uh, same vector diagram if if you had a negative sequence system it's it's quite the opposite so b would lead a by 120 degrees c would lead b by 120 degrees so if you go from a to b, b to c you would move in the counterclockwise direction in a zero sequence system there is no phase difference between the three phases all three phases are in phase with each other which is represented by the, by the three arrows coincident with each other. Now that's the phase sequence or uh, the phase relationships in the three phases on, on the three, uh, three types of uh, systems. Now, based on the phase relationships, the harmonics can be classified under these three categories. So uh, the fundamental fourth, seventh, 10th, 13th, so on and so forth, these, these harmonic orders fall under positive sequence. Second, fifth, eighth, 11th, 14th, these are all negative sequence harmonics. And the multiples of the third harmonic, third, sixth, ninth, twelfth, these harmonics fall under the zero sequence harmonics. Triple N harmonics. So what are triple N harmonics? Triple N harmonics are odd multiples of the third harmonic. So third, ninth, fifteenth. Remember, we spoke about zero sequence harmonics in the previous slide. Triple N harmonics are uh, zero sequence harmonics, but all zero sequence harmonics are not triple N harmonics. So triple N harmonics being zero sequence add at the neutral of a Y connected system. So because they are zero sequence harmonics, uh, on a three-phase system, the currents flowing through the A, B, and C phases do not have any phase angle difference between them. They are coherent, in phase with each other. 
And so when they converge at the neutral, they add up and that results in the total amount of current flowing through the neutral conductor. The neutral is grounded. So the the effect of that is if, if there's a lot of zero sequence harmonics in the system, all of that zero sequence harmonics will flow through the neutral and if the neutral is not sufficiently sized, then there will be overheating of the neutral conductor. Also, these zero sequence harmonics or triple N harmonics can be trapped in the delta winding of a transformer. So one of the main applications of the delta winding of a transformer is to provide a circulating path for zero sequence currents. So if there is a if there's a fault or if, if zero sequence current flows in the system of a, a, when it comes across a Y delta system, a grounded Y and a delta system, the zero sequence currents will flow uh, on into the Y winding and down to the neutral. But on the other side of the transformer, they'll circulate in the delta winding and the currents won't propagate through the system. Okay, so that was a little bit about uh, the theory of harmonics. We covered a few terms there. Now let's move into the next section of the presentation, which is sources of harmonics. So how are harmonics generated? Why all of a sudden do we have uh, this problem? Uh, harmonics, the, the problem of harmonics is very recent. Excuse me. Uh, and that's because of increasing use of non-linear loads uh, or loads which draw a current for only a portion of the voltage waveform. Transformers uh, have been around for a long time, for longer than uh, electronic power converters, let's say. Uh, so harmonics have been around, the problem of harmonics has been around for, uh, for a longer time, but it wasn't so prominent earlier before, uh, before the advent of uh, electronic power converters or ele electronics. So harmonics arise out of non-linear loads. What are non-linear loads and what are linear loads? A linear load is uh, a load uh, whose impedance or resistance doesn't change with, with the change in voltage. So take a resistor of one ohm. If you apply five volts across it, you'll get five amps. If you apply 10 volts across it, you'll get 10 amps. Non-linear loads, on the other hand, the, the impedance changes with voltage. An example, is a transformer on no load. So uh, if you take a transformer uh, with a secondary open, if you apply voltage across it, and if you continue increasing the current, initially there will be uh, the relationship between the voltage and the current that it draws, the, the exciting current. The relationship between the voltage and the current will be linear uh, at low levels of excitation. But as you increase the voltage, slowly it will start becoming non-linear. So the rate of change of current Will be will start increasing uh, uh, as compared with the rate of change of voltage. And as that happens, you will notice that the current becomes more uh, distorted, and that's that's because of the saturation characteristics of the core. We can uh, highlight this using a CT. Let's look at the CT saturation curve. Uh, so. A saturation curve of CT is what it looks like on the y-axis. You have the voltage that's applied across the secondary winding of the CT. On the x-axis, you have the excitation current, the current that the CT winding draws. Uh, you can see that there's a point marked uh, as an asterisk on the graph, and that's your saturation voltage. It's about 180 volts, which tells me that the CT is a C200 CT. Anyway. Uh, so now we are going to take two points on the curve at different voltages, one at 50 volts, one at 30 volts, uh, 130 volts, and let's observe the waveforms on those two points. On the left, you have the waveform at 50 volts. The current is the one in purple. If you look at the waveform, it's pretty clean. Uh, it's sinusoidal. And if you look at the current waveform on the right, at 130 volts, you'll see there's quite a bit of distortion on the current waveform. Switch mode power supplies. So these are uh, one of the most common sources of harmonics because switch mode power supplies are used by 
uh, a lot of devices, computers, printers, copiers, which you find very common. Switch mode power supplies uh, draw current for a portion of the voltage waveform. Uh, switch mode power supplies are essentially rectifiers. So what happens is the AC that you get out of the wall, out of the wall outlet, that's converted into DC. DC is then converted, converted back into high frequency AC, and that's again converted back into DC to give a smooth triple free DC. Now, because switch mode power supplies have rectifier circuits in them, there's a capacitor on the output side of the rectifier circuit, which charges and discharges every cycle, and it draws a short amount of current when it charges, and that, that corresponds to the peak of the voltage waveform. So let's take a simple uh, simulation from a full wave rectifier circuit. Now, if you look at this, uh, there, are, there are two waveforms here. Uh, the waveform on the top, uh, the, the one in blue is the input voltage, and the one in yellow is the capacitor voltage. You see that initially it draws a high amount of current. Now, if you look at this input current, uh, it draws a high amount of current in the first cycle. And then the current that's drawn by the capacitor decreases slowly as the voltage across the capacitor increases. At a certain point, it seems that the voltage across the capacitor is stable, but if you look closely, you'll see that it's not a straight line. You'll see that it, dis it charges up by a little bit and discharges until the next, next cycle, and uh, the process is repeated every cycle. So you get this kind of a waveform from a rectifier circuit. Uh, you'll see that the current is is alternating pulses basically it's not a sinusoidal wave it has pulses on uh, on each half cycle and the the pulses correspond to the peak of the voltage waveform so this is a simulation now let's look at a real waveform from a computer you can see that there is a lot of similarity um, you have these pulses these current pulses which are really sharp, and that's because of the capacitor on the, uh, in the switch mode power supply. On the right, you have the harmonic spectrum. Uh, harmonic spectrum tells you exactly what the magnitude of each harmonic order is uh, with respect to the fundamental. So the first bar graph that you see is the fundamental, and that is at 100%, and all the harmonics are compared with respect to the fundamental. You can see that the harmonic spectrum, this harmonic spectrum has mainly odd harmonics. So there is third, there's fifth, there is seventh, ninth, eleventh, and the magnitude of the harmonics decreases as the order increases. So that's a typical harmonic spectrum that you get from a computer. You can see that the current, uh, even though the harmonics, uh, the, the harmonic content is high, you can see that the current that's drawn by the computer is is small, the peak corresponds to a value of two amps. Uh, but if that, that's one computer, uh, imagine a building which has 50 to 100 working computers in it, and imagine the amount of third harmonics, or the amount of zero sequence harmonics, flowing in the neutral of a transformer that's, that's feeding uh, the, that building. Another example of harmonic sources is fluorescent lighting. Fluorescent lights are discharge lamps. So the way a fluorescent light works is there's, there's gas inside the lamp and uh, an initial high voltage is required to, uh, to kind of cause a discharge. And when the discharge happens, uh, when the, uh, the light is established and there's current flow, the current uh, increases initially. So to, to limit the current, you need uh, a device. So the device that's used along with fluorescent lights is the ballast. And as you can see, the type of ballast that's used with fluorescent lights has an influence on the amount of distortion in the current waveform. There are two types of ballast, magnetic ballast uh, and, and electronic ballast. Magnetic ballasts are simple. Uh, they, they have an iron core transformer or capacitor. Electronic ballasts employ a switch mode power supply circuit. So there's, there's switching involved and you can see that there is much more distortion when electronic ballasts are used. Both, both types of uh, ballasts have their own advantages and disadvantages, and that's why uh, people use either of them.
The next example of a harmonic source is uh, drives. Drives are used commonly in industrial facilities for various applications. Uh, there are there are AC drives, there are DC drives. Uh, AC drives convert AC to DC and then convert it back to AC, uh, possibly of a different frequency. Um, in AC drives, you have different types of drives. There, there are two types mainly. There's voltage source inverters, there's current source inverters. inverters. Voltage source inverters have a capacitor in the DC link and current source inverters have an inductor in the DC link. Uh, you can see that the curves uh, on this particular waveform, you can see that the pulses, the current pulses are quite similar to what we got with a computer. And that's because it's, in, it's essentially a three-phase version of a switch mode power supply. Uh, you can see that the pulses are sharp uh, and that's because there's no inductor in the circuit. Uh, but current, for current source inverters, the pulses won't be this sharp. It will be rounded out. That's because of the presence of an inductor at the DC link. On the right, you have, again, the harmonic spectrum. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see that it has a fifth and seventh harmonic content. It has 11th and 13th harmonic content. And the harmonic spectrum depends on the pulse configuration of the drive. So a six pulse drive will have six plus minus one uh, order harmonics. It'll have six times two plus minus one order harmonics. And that's what you see on the harmonic spectrum. So just by looking at the harmonic spectrum, I can tell that this is a six pulse drive. Okay, so now that we have seen a few uh, different types of harmonic sources, let's go into the second, the next section of the presentation, which is current and voltage harmonics. So what are current harmonics? What are voltage harmonics? Current harmonics are what we what we saw so far. So whatever current comes out of a nonlinear load or is drawn by the load, uh, that's that's uh, that's the current um, that's the distorted current with the current harmonics. Now when that distorted current flows through the system impedance, uh, it gives rise to voltage distortion. Okay, so you can say that voltage harmonics are caused by current harmonics. So the current distortion depends on the load, solely depends on the load, but the voltage distortion depends on the current as well as the system impedance uh, 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 through, which the, through which the current passes. So this is a simple representation uh, of, the, of the load flowing through the system and causing distortion uh, at the load bus. All right, there was a short section. Let's let's move on to the next one, which is on harmonics measurement techniques. So how are harmonics measured? The standard that deals with harmonics measurement is IC 61000-4-7. The measurement interval specified in the standard is 200 milliseconds. That corresponds to 10 cycles or 12 cycles, depending on whether the system is 50 hertz or 60 hertz. The 200 millisecond values can then be aggregated over longer intervals of time. So three seconds, 10 minutes, or two hours. And that's for class A instruments. There are, there are different types of instruments specified in the standard, different types of requirements for those different types of instruments. So class A, class B, and class C, uh, class S, I'm sorry. Uh, class A has the most stringent requirements, and uh, this is uh, the, the, this is what the intervals are uh, uh, that, that are specified for class A instruments. Uh, it also says that at least up to the 50th order harmonics need to be measured. So, how are harmonics measured? There are there are two domains essentially. There's time domain and there's frequency domain. So the waveforms that we saw so far during the presentation, all the waveforms were in the time domain. And the harmonic spectrum that you saw, that's, that's what you get after breaking the waveform up and uh, into the different frequency components and essentially converting it into frequency domain. So how is the conversion done from, from time domain to frequency domain? Uh, it's done by a, a technique called DFT, discrete Fourier transform. Uh, or a faster version of it called fast Fourier transform. 
when you analyze a waveform and do DFT, FFT on it, you get the frequency spectrum of the waveform and uh, you essentially get different frequency components over, over the, the wide range of frequencies. Now, how do you come up with harmonics from this? Uh, what you get is essentially those, those red graphs that you see, each red bar corresponds to a five hertz bin. So let's take 180 hertz, for example. Now the, the frequency of 180 hertz is at the center band, is at the center of a five hertz bin. There is a five hertz bin to the right of it, is a five hertz bin to the left of it. So if you take those three five hertz band, uh, five hertz bins around 180 hertz, you get a single 15 hertz band, and all the frequency components which feature in this 15 hertz band. So 180 plus 7.5, 180 minus 7.5, all those frequency components would be grouped under the third harmonic. Similarly, if we go to the second or harmonic frequency, 120 hertz. Uh, take the 15 hertz band around 120 hertz, so plus minus 7.5 hertz. All the frequency components which show up in this bin are in this band are grouped together under second harmonic. Okay, so the next section we are going to look at harmonic indices. So you might have heard the terms THD, TDD. What do you mean by THD? THD is total harmonic distortion. It's a single parameter used to quantify the presence of harmonics in the system. Uh, it is obtained by using all the individual harmonic components that you get and essentially using the ratio of the individual harmonics to the fundamental. You can see the formula there. Uh, and as per the European standard EN50160, the acceptable limit for voltage uh, THD is 8%. Now, can this term be used for current? Uh, we'll, we'll see that later. But before we do that, let's look at the chart for total harmonic distortion. This is what a chart looks like. This is from a week-long recording, maybe about eight days. Uh, if you see closely, you will see that there is a bit of a pattern here. It repeats itself. Uh, after every uh, every cycle actually corresponds to a day. So why is that? Because THT corresponds to the load of uh, of the plant, and that's why it's essential that you, when you when you do harmonics measurement at a facility, uh, you need to uh, keep the recorder in there for at least a week to get the full picture. Okay, so voltage and current fluctuation-wise, uh, there's not much fluctuation in voltage. Voltage stays pretty much constant, close to the nominal value. But the current can change drastically over a short span of time uh, based on the load. So if the load, uh, the load could draw 500 amps one second, the next second the load could drop to 50 amps. So there's a lot of changes in current. So uh, let's let's take a constant harmonic current of one amp in the system. If the fundamental is 10 amps, the the harmonic uh, percentage-wise, that harmonic current is one divided by 10, 10 percent. If the fundamental goes up to 100 amps, the same harmonic current becomes one percent. Right? So if we use the same principle that we use for voltage and calculate the THD uh, going uh, taking the fundamental into consideration, we're going to have, we we could get the wrong picture. It's a THD is not the ideal term to use for, for current harmonics analysis. Uh, that's why we go with a term called TDD, total demand distortion. For TDD, the fundamental is taken as the, the, the max peak current recorded over the demand interval is used as the fundamental. So if you are recording with 15 minute demand intervals, the current that's the peak value that's recorded over that 15 minute interval uh, would be the fundamental for, for TDD calculation in that 15 minute interval. So 
So this is the comparison of a THD chart and a TDD chart. On top you have the THD chart, uh, in the bottom you have the TDD chart for the same recording. If you look at the pattern, you will see that they are pretty similar to each other. Uh, they follow the same pattern. Uh, but if you look at the values on the y-axis, you will see a drastic difference here. On the THD, it ranges from 7.8 to uh, 14%. Uh, for the TDD, however, the, the values are pretty much within 1%. The next section is on harmonic powers. Power is measured by looking at the true RMS values of uh, voltage and current. Uh, harmonic powers, uh, if you take individual harmonic powers, uh, the flows, the direction of the flows differs from harmonic to harmonic. Uh, so it's, it's not essentially the same as the fundamental power. So you get the direction of the power flow by looking at the phase relationship uh, of the harmonics with the fundamental. If the phase angle difference lies in this range, so between 90 uh, to 270 on the positive side, uh, then the, the direction is from source to load. If the phase angle difference is uh, in, in, these, in the negative quadrant, so if it's in this range, then the direction is from the load to the source. This is a power waveform, and uh, on the right, you can see the harmonics, the individual harmonic contents in the power waveform. Uh, here you have a column for phase angle, and here you have a column for direction. Uh, direction, it says either S or L, and that's uh, that's determined from the phase angle difference. You can see the fundamental phase angle is zero and all the other angles are looked at with respect to the fundamental. If the direction is uh, from source to load, then S is uh, given the table. If the direction is from the load to source, then the letter L appears in the table. There are two types of power factor values uh, mentioned in the power quality field. Uh, we'll look at what those mean. Displacement power factor, uh, true power factor. Uh, displacement power factor is the cosine of the phase angle between the voltage and current. It depends only on the fundamental component. True power factor is the ratio of the active power to the apparent power. Uh, in a harmonic free system, you're not going to get difference between the displacement power factor and true power factor. So both of them are essentially going to be the same. Uh, the presence of harmonics, however, creates a difference. It causes the RMS values of the voltage and current to go up. So you're going to have higher RMS values for voltage and current, which is going to result in a higher KVA, uh, which is going to, again, cause the true power factor value to go down. There's going to be a bit of a difference between the true power factor and displacement power factor if there are harmonics in the system. A classic example of this is, uh, again, a drive, variable frequency drive. Now, this is uh, the demand report from uh, variable frequency drive. If you look at the displacement power factor and true power factor, you'll see that there's a bit of a difference there. The displacement power factor is pretty close to unity. True power factor is lesser, it's around 0.86. Let's, let's look a little further and let's, uh, let's pull up the phase angle information. If you look at the phase angle difference between the voltage and current on the A phase, for example, we'll see that we see that there's a phase angle difference of 10 degrees. The displacement power factor is the cosine of 10 degrees, which is pretty close to unity, 0.98, 0 0.99. 0 uh, but if you look at the true power, the true power is determined, uh, the true power factor is determined from the ratio of the real power to the apparent power. 
and that's how you get the value of 0 0.86. This is what we are familiar with. This is for a harmonics free system. So the relationship between apparent power S, real power P, and reactive power Q. Um, but if you have harmonics in the system, there is an additional term D in the equation. Uh, and this, this is what the relationship becomes. Effects of harmonics. So what effects do harmonics have on the system? Uh, we already spoke a little bit about how zero sequence harmonics can cause overheating of the neutral. Harmonics can also cause increased uh, copper losses or I square R losses. Harmonics are essentially current, so they add to the heating effect uh, that happens when current flows through a conductor. Uh, Harmonics can also cause eddy current losses. So what are eddy current losses? When current flows in the vicinity of a metal part, the field of the current um, creates, sets up local circuits in the metal part. It induces EMFs, and these local induced EMFs uh, set up local circulating currents in the metal part. Those currents are called eddy current loss, uh, eddy currents, and those eddy currents uh, cause eddy current losses. Besides that, uh, there, are, there are different core structures. The bigger transformers usually have a five-legged core. So you have the three legs of the core on which the windings are present, and there are two auxiliary limbs. Uh, on smaller transformers, however, the cores are three legs. So when you have zero sequence currents in the system, there's gonna be zero sequence fluxes in the core. And those zero sequence fluxes will need a return path. In a three-leg code, the, the only return path is to escape through the, the metal parts of the, the transformer. So whatever is metal inside the transformer, uh, apart from the core, all of those metal parts are not um, meant to be there to handle flux flow. So obviously there's gonna be a lot of heating, there's gonna be deterioration because of that. Uh, so zero sequence fluxes can cause a lot of problems um, in, in three-leg code transformers. So because of whatever harmonics uh, do to a transformer, there is, there is a standard that deals with uh, using a transformer on a non-sinusoidal load. Uh, the standard is called C57.110. And th there's, a, there's a term called K factor, which is mentioned to indicate, uh, to enable uh, the sizing of a transformer with respect to the, the load that, that's being used. So based on the harmonic content of the load, we arrive at a factor called K factor. Formula is given on the slide. Uh, you can see that the formula includes three terms, IH, IR, and H. IH is uh, the, the individual harmonic current. IR is the total current or the, or the fundamental current. H is the harmonic order. So you can see that the harmonic order uh, shows up in the formula, and that's because the uh, the eddy current losses that are caused by harmonics uh, depend on are, that are proportional to the square of the frequency of the currents. That's the reason you have the edge squared. Now, if the K factor that's calculated from the load is, let's say, uh, two, then the transformer that's going to handle that load needs to be a K4 transformer. And I'm just giving you an example. The K rating of the transformer needs to be higher than the K factor that's obtained on the load. Effects of harmonics on motor. Harmonic voltage is gonna result in harmonic fluxes, which rotate at a frequency different than the rotor frequency, which rotates at close to the fundamental frequency. So the frequency difference is going to, uh, the, the interaction between the flux and the the conductor is going to result in induced currents. These currents are going to cause heating and losses. Besides that, the, the interaction between the, uh, the currents and the field results in uh, a torque, uh, called pulsating torque, 
that's going to cause oscillations on the shaft now if the the frequency uh, of the uh, the pulsations matches with the uh, the natural frequency of the shaft then that can result in a mechanical resonance that can basically amplify the effect that that occurred due to these oscillations and can also result in damage to the shaft uh, So what is resonance? Uh, we're talking about electrical resonance here. Uh, what, uh, what is it? So in a, in a circuit, you have uh, a resistance, you have an inductance, you have a capacitance. If the inductive reactance matches with the capacitive reactance, in, inductance and capacitance essentially have opposing effects uh, on a circuit. If the inductive reactance is exactly equal to the capacitive reactance, then the resultant reactance of the circuit becomes zero. So the only obstruction that you have in the circuit is the uh, resistance. So when that happens, what you have is an easy path for currents to flow. Uh, resonance can occur in two ways, series and parallel. If the inductor and the capacitor are in series, then series resonance. If the inductor and the capacitance are in parallel, then it's parallel resonance. So how does this uh, show up on, uh, uh, on, how does this re relate to harmonics? I told you that the, the resonance condition is achieved when the inductive reactance is equal to the capacitive reactance. If you simplify the equation a bit, you get the role of frequency in the circuit. So the reactance uh, is frequency dependent. So apart from L and C, uh, if, uh, F shows up in the equation. And if the L and C on the system are such that resonance, that, that equation is met at a particular harmonic frequency, then it will result in a large amount of harmonic currents of that particular frequency flowing in the resonance circuit, uh, basically amplifying the voltage distortion that would have normally occurred if there was no resonance. These are two uh, pictures highlighting the effect uh, or how parallel or series resonance can happen. On the left, you have a harmonic source. Uh, there's a capacitor bank in, um, in parallel with it. There is a transformer here, there's source impedance. So the harmonic source essentially sees it as a parallel resonance circuit. You have the C in parallel with the L. Uh, on the right, you have a series resonance example uh, you have all these harmonic sources, and all these harmonic sources see this particular portion as a series LC circuit. So you have the transformer in series with the capacitor bank, and that series LC circuit, if the frequency uh, of these harmonics uh, is such that it meets the resonance equation, uh, then there's going to be a high amount of current flow through this branch. Now let's come to uh, this section on harmonics evaluation. Harmonics evaluation, uh, we, we, we spoke a little bit about current and voltage harmonics. Current harmonics depends wholly on the load. So it's the customer that's responsible for making sure that the current harmonics are within limits. Uh, when these current harmonics, when the distorted current flows through the system impedance, it's going to result in voltage distortion. So it's essentially the utility's responsibility to make sure that the voltage harmonics are within limit provided the current harmonics are within limit. Evaluation is carried out at the point of common coupling. A uh, point of common coupling is a point at which a utility serves multiple customers. Uh, and as I said, the duration should be at least one week uh, to make sure that the, the plant cycle is covered. This is a simple diagram. You have the utility, um, you have electricity coming in. There's a, there's a transfer. There's a there's a, a bus uh, feeding to customers. Uh, the point of common coupling here would be this particular point. So you can hook up the recorder on the secondary of the transfer or on the primary of the transfer, 
uh, you have to uh, understand though that if you if it's a delta y transformer and if you do the measurements on the secondary you're going to see the zero sequence current on the the primary side of the transformer though on the on the delta side you won't see those zero sequence currents as the zero sequence currents are trapped in the delta winding of the transformer Harmonic mitigation. So what are the different approaches to control harmonics? Uh, one is you can reduce the harmonics on the load itself, uh, which is kind of limited. I mean, most of the devices are designed within, uh, designed to particular specifications. Uh, take an overexcited transformer, for example. You can bring the excitation level down and that would reduce the distortion in the current. Uh, you can use filters, so shunt or series filters. Shunt filters uh, act as a shunt. They bypass the harmonics that they are intended to bypass. Series filters suppress the harmonics. Uh, changing system response characteristics. So, uh, for example, to avoid resonance, you can change the L and C of the system if, uh, to make sure that the resonance doesn't occur at a particular frequency f. So uh, that that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, before I wrap up, I would like to go a little bit over what we offer in the field of power quality. Uh, what we have is the MPQ2000, which is a three-phase power quality analyzer. Um, it measures harmonics, yes, but it does a lot of things apart from that. Uh, it's a class A measurement device. Remember, I spoke a little bit about uh, the different classes specified in the IC standards. So it's a class A measurement device. It has auto CT identification, configuration verification. Uh, these features are intended to make sure that there is minimal operator error. Uh, it can be frustrating if the, if the user places the recorder at a particular location, records for one week, and then finds out at the end that uh, all this information was wrongly recorded. There was some mistake during the recording. So to avoid that, we have auto CT identification, which tells you uh, that uh, uh, there is a mismatch. If, if there's a mismatch between the CT ratio that's entered and the uh, ratio that's programmed on the recorder, you get a mismatch message. Configuration verification tells you whether you have hooked up in the right manner. Uh, if, you, if you have a delta, uh, if you program the recorder to record on a delta and you hook it up on a Y-connected system, it'll tell you that you're hooked up wrong. Uh, if you connect the CT backwards, it will tell you the CT is hooked up backwards. Uh, it doesn't need a separate power outlet. It's part of the A phase of the system to which it's connected. Uh, all the test data is recorded on SD cards. The maximum memory that it supports is 32 gigs, so memory is not a limitation at all. Uh, it's very rugged and portable. Uh, it's IP54 uh, rated with the lid closed. It also has onboard data analysis on it. So if you want to carry out statistical analysis of data um, on, on the recorder itself without having to download it to your computer, you can do that. You can create your own templates or follow the templates that are given on the, uh, on the recorder that are provided on the recorder as per EN50160. These are some screenshots from what the screen looks like. On the left, you have the, the unbalanced screen where it shows you the vector relationships between the three phases. On the right, you have the recording screen. So you can see the voltage and the current. The configuration verification message. If you make any mistake while making connections, it, it gives you a message when you, when you start recording. On the right, you have the onboard data analysis screen. The reference that I use for this presentation. Uh, thank you guys for listening in, and uh, I'm gonna have Sarah take over. Awesome, thank you, Sankat. Great job. All right, that concludes the presentation portion of our webinar. We're gonna get into our Q&A section, and again, on the right side of your screen, there's that Q&A box if you've got some questions. We've already had a ton of questions rolling in. Um, again, I just want to remind everyone. Uh, 
uh, that a copy of the presentation along with a link to the video recording of the webinar, it will be emailed to everyone within about two business days after this concludes. So you'll be getting that in your inbox. We've got another uh, recording coming up, or I'm sorry, not a recording, another webinar coming up next month. It's titled Test Data Management for NERC Compliance Reporting. It's going to be on May 18th at 10 a.m. with Mark Meyer. He's a product manager for PowerDB. Also, all of our previous webinars you can find on our website. Just go to megger.com, select your country, go to webinars, and you can find all the recordings there. Um, right now, I think we're just going to go ahead and jump on in. Um, I'm going to kind of go between Andy and Sanket, so we'll kind of tag team both of you. The first question I'm going to toss to Andy. Uh, let's see here. We've got a question from Jeff. He asks, is it true to state that if a transformer is oversized for its use, then you run a higher risk of harmonic issues. <clears throat> no, um, actually, when you uh, tr the harmonics are actually caused by nonlinear loads. So, provided that you're not operating the transformer in saturation, the transformer isn't going to create any harmonic issues. The issues, the harmonics will be created by the nonlinear loads that are connected to it. So, typically. When you get a K-rated uh, transformer, which is K-factor derated, it's typically going to have oversized um, coils or, or oversized ground in it to help deal with the eddy currents that are caused by these nonlinear loads that are creating the heating issues that you see within the transformers. Perfect. Uh, Songket, I'm going to toss one your way. This comes from Prem. He's asking, how do we categorize 1, 4, 7, 10 are positive sequence harmonics and 2, 5, 8, and 11 are negative VE? Okay. So that depends, uh, like I said, that depends on the phase angle relationship. And the fourth order harmonics, let's take positive sequence harmonics, for example. The fourth order harmonics, seventh order harmonics, tenth order harmonics, they uh, if you if you uh, it, it's basically a mathemat I, I could explain it to you in a in a mathematical equation if you if you put the frequency in there uh, instead of omega if you have four omega and if you look at the phase angle differences uh, it it basically has the phase angle relation the same phase angle relationship as the fundamental uh, so if, the, the relationship between the a b and c at four times the fundamental frequency ends up being the same as the, the uh, a positive sequence or the same as fundamental. Similarly, uh, for, for second harmonics, fifth, eighth, eleventh, uh, it ends up being negative uh, sequence. So uh, B, B, for, for negative sequence, B, I, mean, I said all this during the presentation, B leads A and C leads B, but uh, it, it depends on the frequency and uh, the phase relationship between the A, B, and C phase. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Andy, I've got one for you. This comes from Mohammed. He asks, which type of harmonics mostly occur in power systems, odd or even harmonics? <clears throat> odd is by far the more common because when you look at your power supplies um, or nonlinear loads, they're going to be rectifying the AC into DC. Most equipment works off DC and has power supplies that rectify the power. These rectifiers will rectify the AC signal symmetrically, meaning the positive and negative of the AC both get rectified, which will always result in odd harmonics. When you start seeing high levels of even harmonics, that's typically an indication that there is a faulty rectifier somewhere because now the, um, the signal is not being rectified symmetrically. So typically, high levels of even harmonics will uh, show will be an indication that there's a bad piece of equipment somewhere on the system. Okay, perfect. Uh, Sanket, the next one's for you. Unfortunately, I wasn't given a name on this, but they ask, can you please re-explain the harmonic grouping after DFT, FFT in frequency domain? Okay, so uh, what you're doing is you're you're basically breaking up the the waveform into different frequency components. 
and when you when you do that it, it depends on the uh, the sampling window which 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 basically in, in frequency it corresponds to 5 hertz so you picture this you you divide uh, the the frequencies into 5 hertz bins so uh, by bins what i mean is uh, you have let's say 0 to 5 uh, 1 to 0 to 5 hertz um, 5 hertz to 10 hertz 10 to 15 hertz 15 to 20 hertz so those are 5 hertz bins so uh, what you're doing is essentially breaking it up into different frequency components and then whatever frequency components uh, you're going to have like uh, it's it's not always going to be 180 hertz there's going to be 182 hertz there's going to be 183 hertz there's going to be 179 hertz there's going to be a component that's going to have a frequency of 176 hertz so you don't for third harmonics you don't just consider whatever uh, has the frequency of 180 hertz you also end up considering the frequency components which occur in the vicinity of 180 hertz so i'm just giving you an example for third harmonic uh, when you get the frequency total the frequency spectrum for the whole waveform you look at the components that show up in the range of plus minus 7.5 hertz of 180 hertz so when when your recorder shows you third harmonic if it's measuring as per the ic standard it's not just showing you whatever the 180 hertz component is uh, it's not showing you exactly the 180 hertz component it's measuring all the frequency components which which show up in that band of 15 hertz plus minus 7.5 hertz so anything that's measured between 172.5 hertz to 187.5 hertz is classified as a third harmonic that, that's what i meant by harmonic grouping Perfect. Andy, I've got another one I'm going to toss at you. This comes from Ahmed. He's asking, for TDD calculation, should I take the max current of my measuring interval of the rated current of my load? Well, per the IEEE 519, uh, when TDD is calculated, uh, you're going to be using either a 15-minute or a 30-minute interval. Uh, for each of these intervals, you will calculate an average current, or you'll measure an average current for each of these intervals. And the reference you will use is the maximum average current that was recorded in your test interval. That's the reference to use for the TDD calculation. Got it. Uh, the next one, Sanket, this one's for you. And it is from Mike. He's asking, was the 8% limit on harmonics referring to THD or TDD? It seems like it should be for TDD. Uh, the 8% hum uh, limit is given for voltage THD. So it's for voltage THD, not, not current. It's just referring to the voltage total harmonic distortion. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think there is any limit for for THD or TDD on the current, I, I could be wrong. Maybe Andy could help out with this. Uh, but but the the eight percent limit that I mentioned in the European standard uh, EN five zero one six zero, the the limit is for voltage THD. Yes, the five nineteen standard. There are some limits or recommended limits on TDD, but they're also you have to calculate the short circuit current as well for your system. And I would recommend just looking at the 519 uh, uh, specification for those uh, for those indices. Okay, uh, Andy, here's another one for you. This comes from Deepak. He's asking, can harmonics also lead to ferro resonances in transformers too? Not typically. Uh, ferro resonance is mainly going to occur in uh, delta transformers, ungrounded transformers. Um, this is a result typically of a load turning off rapidly. What ends up happening, when you have long cable runs going to that transformer, and this applies to motors too, when you have long cable runs going to that uh, transformer, those cables act as capacitors. They store a lot of charge in them. The longer the cable, the more charge you have stored. In the transformer, the transformer is storing a large amount of energy in its magnetic field. 
So when you have a load that will turn off suddenly, it acts like a switch. And what can happen is that energy in the magnetic field will dump onto the cable capacitance. They'll add together and create a very large amount of um, uh, voltage, which can be you know, up to five times higher than uh, what would usually be on that primary. So typically, it's more load of, uh, when the loads get low on ungrounded transformers. It's not typically due to actual harmonics. Thank you so much. Um, we've got, well, I think we've got time for about one more question. I'm so sorry, everybody. We, I know we've we've got a ton more questions we haven't even gotten to look at yet. I'm going to ask one more just for time's sake. Uh, Sanket, this one's going to go for you. It's from Ahmed. It, uh, and he's asking, effective harmonics on transformer, transformer metal part is valid for any other load, even if it was single phase. Um, yes, uh, I think I understood the question fully, but, but if you mean that harmonics do harmonics do the same thing if it's a single phase, uh, then yes, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, three phase. If harmonics, if there's going to be harmonics in the current, uh, uh, harmonics uh, in the transformer, they're going to have the same effect, uh, regardless of whether it's a single phase or uh, or a three phase. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Well, that's going to conclude our time for the Q&A session. Um, as you leave and when you close your webinar window, a survey should pop up on the screen. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve our future webinars. And on the survey, there's a field where you can also request a demo or quote of any of our mega products. Um, also wanted to make you guys aware that we've got a great hands-on power quality and harmonics training course from AVO Training Institute. If you visit avotraining.com, you can view the upcoming schedule for all their courses. AVO's been doing training for over 50 years, and they've got some of the most knowledgeable and experienced instructors around, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Um, again, I apologize. We weren't able to get to all the questions. We had some really, really good questions today. Uh, we'll try to get to those. It, as long as you entered in your email address whenever you registered, we should be able to get those questions answered for you. Thank you all for attending so much. If, again, you can please remember to answer that survey. And we hope to see you at our next webinar. Everybody have a great and safe weekend. Thank you so much.